Well, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Caroline Barnett. I'm the branch manager here. We're delighted that you're here and we're very pleased and appreciate the time of the members of the Memphis Astronomical Society. Jeremy Melvin's going to be our main presenter, I think, and you can introduce your other folks. But I do want to uh, be sure that everybody knows you can get some glasses and we will be doing viewing here at the library and uh, do have some things in the back with our uh, additional programs that are coming up. Come on in. And uh, next week is National Library Week, so we've got lots of things going on next week. We've got a great author coming on Saturday, a uh, storyteller. We've got uh, a Bugs program on Friday and all kinds of things. So please come and join us for all of our activities. And when you, please do take the glasses so that you're sure you're safe. I'm sure that Jeremy will be talking about that. But uh, we're glad you're here and look forward to hearing about the eclipse. All right, thank you, Carolyn. Seats up here. Yeah, we got a few more seats up front. If you, if you, uh, if you got anybody else who wants to sit together, otherwise just kind of fill in. So, um, I'm Jeremy Veldman. I'm the current president of the Memphis Astronomical Society. We have been around since 1953. We're 70 years old. I'm not, but our organization is. We're basically a nonprofit public service organization, and we study astronomy and related sciences. If you'd like to learn more about our organization. Uh, you can click that QR code, scan that QR code right there, join our email list. We, um, and we've got some postcards up here as well. Website is memphisastro.org. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. And we meet once a month. Our next meeting is actually tomorrow night. And, of course, it's just Eclipse stuff. So, But um, that's kind of who we are. We do observing sessions multiple times a month, depending on the weather, either at dark sky locations or, we, or for community centers like this. We've, uh, we've been here several times. I was actually in this room seven years ago. I think this is the last time I was here, just you know, a little less than seven years ago in preparation for the last eclipse. So it's kind of hard to believe that we're back here again getting ready for another one. So anyway, um, obviously we've got a solar eclipse coming up. I've been giving this talk now for a couple of years, more frequently in the last couple of weeks. I've been calling this one the heartbreaker for obvious reasons. Millions of people live in the path, and a lot of people are going to miss it because of the, of the clouds. That's just kind of the unfortunate reality. So we'll talk about that. We'll get into it. And we keep a, obviously, we keep a good thought. And we're getting kind of down to go time here. So anyway, a couple of fundamentals here. So the, the moon orbits the Earth every 29 and a half days or so. That's why it goes through different phases. So we're basically right here, waning crescent, and then on Monday, we get a new moon. That's, of course, a new moon is when the moon is between the Earth and the sun, and we start a new lunar phase. Now, what makes Monday special is we also get this rare alignment where the moon can block out the sun for a few minutes during the day, depending on where you are on planet Earth. So the moon's shadow, when you have this eclipse alignment, is divided into two parts. The penumbral shadow, which is about 4,000 miles wide, covers about half of the daylight side of the Earth. If you're in that shadow, you see a partial eclipse. That's where, of course, Memphis and the surrounding areas are. We're in the penumbra, deep partial phases. But the real action is if you're in this narrow shadow cone called the umbra, and that's where the moon completely eclipses the sun and you get all the phenomenal experiences that people, of course, rave about during a solar eclipse. So and I'll show you the difference between being here in Memphis versus being just a little further west or north if you're in the eclipse path. Now, you ask yourself, if the moon comes between the Earth and the sun and it's new every month, why don't we get an eclipse every month? And it turns out that the plane of the moon's orbit around the Earth and the plane of the moon's, or the Earth's orbit around the sun are not exactly aligned. There's actually a slight tilt, about five degrees. So if I demonstrate this with these two hoops here, and most of the time during a new moon or a full moon phase, the moon is actually, I'm trying to do this by hand here, uh, if you can imagine the bottom loop here being the moon's orbit, and then the top loop being the Earth's orbit around the sun, the moon's shadow misses us. It's either below or above us. And you can see from this diagram here just how far away the moon is in space relative to the sizes of the Earth and moon. And we have other kind of uh, interesting contraptions here. You know, the relative sizes of the moon and Earth on a scale model 
um, and you can take this outside, imagine the sun now being 400 times further away from the earth than the moon is and just how hard it would be to get these to line up where the moon's shadow actually strikes the surface of the earth. So eclipses are very rare. In fact, on average, about one in 10,000 people have ever seen an eclipse in their lifetime. So we're very fortunate. If you've seen one, has anybody here ever seen a total solar eclipse? Okay, we've got several people who have. Anybody here not ever seen a total solar eclipse? All right, so we got, we got a little bit of a mix here. So, okay, breaking this down again further, three things need to happen, really five things. Three things need to happen simultaneously for an eclipse to occur. Number one is the moon, of course, has to be new. It will be on April 8. It also has to be located at a lunar node. So uh, the two hoops that I just showed you earlier, where these two, the planes of the moon's orbit and the planes of the Earth's orbit around the sun intersect, it's called a, it's called a node. And in fact, uh, of course, two planes intersect at a line, right? So it's really called the line of nodes. And then the points, you know, two points of a, a line is basically the, the shortest distance between two points. Those points are called nodes. So where, the, where those uh, orbital planes intersect, called a node, you need to have the moon located there while it's new in order for the conditions of, a, of an eclipse to occur. Now the third thing that needs to happen is the moon needs to be at perigee. The moon orbits the earth not in a perfect circle, it's slightly elliptical, Kepler's first law of planetary motion. So there are times when it's slightly closer to us, perigee, 224,000 miles, and then there are times when it's further away, apogee, 252,000 miles. So that's the difference. Now, if you get conditions one and two to occur at the same time, but not three, you can get what's called an annular eclipse. I'll explain that in a second. But first of all, the sun is enormous. It's a million times larger in terms of volume than the earth. On this scale here, the earth is just a very tiny dot. Moon is even smaller yet, you can barely see it. So the question you ask yourself is, how can the moon eclipse the sun when the sun is so much larger than the moon? And it turns out if you, you would need to line up 400 moons in order to equate to the, the, the diameter of the sun. So the sun's diameter is 400 times longer than the, uh, the moon's diameter. But we just happen to live on a world where the sun is also 400 times further away. So from our vantage point in the sky, the moon and the sun during an eclipse appear to be basically the same angular size. So our sun can perfectly eclipse our moon. It's really amazing. It's miraculous, in fact. Now, it's a little more subtle than that because, again, depending on where the moon is in its orbit, whether it's at perigee or apogee, uh, its size in our sky can vary up to 14%. So if it's at apogee, then you might get this, where the moon is slightly smaller and not close enough to be able to perfectly eclipse our sun. So when that happens, you get what's called an annular eclipse. We had this back in October. I was fortunate enough to, anybody see this eclipse, this annular eclipse? It was actually partial here. You had to be, okay, so some people saw it. You had to be in the path of annularity to see that. And I was fortunate enough to see this in Ely, Nevada, as part of a team from the Exploratorium in, in San Francisco that does live broadcasts of the eclipse around the world. And you can actually catch a video documentary of that on our YouTube channel. My colleague, Rick Honey, who did the lion's share of the work, is going to Torreon, Mexico, to broadcast this eclipse for the Exploratorium. So there will be live satellite feeds all around the world on YouTube, and the telescope that's broadcasting that feed comes from my colleague, Rick Honey, of the Memphis Astronomical Society. How cool is that? So anyway, that's an annular eclipse. Annulus means ring. It's the Latin term for ring. So nice eclipse but nothing compared to what we've got coming up on Monday. The big show is on Monday. So here's the punchline. We've got two solar eclipses in a six month period of time. We just had the annular in October. This is where you needed to be to see it. We were right there in, in uh, Ely, Nevada. They had another team, Cantori, Jim Cantori was in, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we had great weather in October. So most of us saw it. Here's what we got coming up on Monday. So this is the big show. Now, from the vantage point of space, you can see kind of the alignment of the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun, and how small the umbral cone is as it crosses the daylight side of the Earth, less than 1% of the daytime side of the Earth. 
can actually be fully immersed in the moon's shadow. Most of the time it's over water or over distant lands that are either inaccessible or not very habit or host uh, hab uh, hospitable. But we just happen to be fortunate enough to be located close enough where the umbra comes very close to where we are. Crosses Texas, Arkansas, parts of Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and then of course up through the Great Lakes and New England. So traveling about 1800 miles an hour when, when it reaches us and it'll speed up as it goes out to sea. When it gets to New England, it's about 2800 miles per hour. So if you wanna see it in multiple places, all you gotta do is get into a fast sports car and drive about 2000 miles per hour <laughs> and you can see it in multiple places. I get that question sometimes. All right. In the 19th century, eclipse, eclipse, eclipse expeditions were a thing. And people traveled sometimes thousands of miles to some of the most remotest parts of, on Earth just to see an eclipse. At that time, people were trying to figure out what the sun was and what made the sun work. One of the most remote sites that uh, people ever tra uh, traveled to to see an eclipse was in 1883. And American and French solar eclipse expeditions traveled to Caroline Island, a tiny coral atoll, now part of the Independent Republic of Kiribati, located some 2,100 miles south of the Hawaiian Islands. Caroline Island was almost on the center line of the eclipse of May 6, 1883, and experienced five and a half minutes of totality. Round trip, the 22-member U.S. English expedition, whose camp is shown here, took 101 days and covered more than 24,000 kilometers. So you had to commit if you wanted to see an eclipse back in the 19th century. Sky and Telescope Magazine, April 2024 edition uh, goes on. Even with careful planning and preparation, there was no guarantee of success or even survival. James Melville Gillis led a four-man U.S. Navy expedition to almost Peru for one minute of totality on September 7, 1858. While crossing the formidable windswept deep sand of, of Peru's Sakura Desert, he became so severely dehydrated that in almost he collapsed. Quote, while it's lying upon the ground, he wrote, I instructed my young friend as to each portion of the telescope until it was satisfactorily mounted. Another British astronomer, Father Stephen Perry, traveled to Salou Isle off the coast of French Guiana to observe the total solar eclipse of December 22, 1889. He fell so ill with dysentery that on E-Day, he had to be carried to his instruments so he could observe. Five days later, he died. So people have died trying to get into the path of totality. So you think you're inconvenienced to now having to travel a few miles to get into the path of totality. I say maybe we've gotten a little softer in the last couple of centuries. So anyway, so make an effort to get into the path. That's kind of my pitch. Here it is, of course. Um, you know, I mentioned the penumbral shadow, 4,000 miles wide. The umbra is on average about 100 miles wide. In this particular case, 124 miles wide. So we're, we're in a good spot in terms of strategic location to, to, to make our choices. And it turns out that's probably going to work in our favor for this one because the forecast is not in our favor. Um, okay, Saros. The ancient Greeks and Babylonians independently discovered the Sero cycle, and they documented it on stone tablets, cuneiform. And then also this right here is a mechanism of an ancient computer, Greek computer, that was recovered off of the island of Antikythera in 1901. We think that they had a machine that was used in the classical period thousands of years ago to track the movements of the sun and moon and their relationship, including eclipses. So here's kind of how it breaks down, the Sero cycle. So I told you earlier that the moon orbits the Earth every 29 and a half days. Turns out it's a little more subtle than that. That's the synodic period. That's from new moon to new moon. Basically, that's the moon's position in the sky relative to the sun's position in the sky each month. In actuality, to travel the orbital path, it takes slightly less time than that. So the moon gets from perigee to perigee in about 27 and a half days from node to node in about 27.2 days. It takes a little longer for the synodic period, new moon to new moon, because the Earth is also moving and it takes a couple more days for the moon to catch up to where the sun is in our sky because the Earth is also moving around the, the sun. Okay, here's, here's what they figured out. If you do the math and you project forward, it turns out that 223 synodic months, 
new moon to new moon, is almost equivalent to 239 anomalistic months. Again, perigee to perigee. And that's almost equivalent to 242 draconic months node to node. So if you go forward in time, 6,585 days and change, which is equivalent to 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours, the geometry of the eclipse path repeats itself somewhere on Earth. So this eclipse and every other solar eclipse is part of a family of eclipses called a Saros. In this particular case, the one we're going to see on Monday is part of Saros number 139. It's eclipse 30 in that family of eclipses that began in the year 1501 and will end in the year 2763, about 12 to 13 centuries. That's the cosmic significance. Think of how different the world was in 1501, nine years after Columbus discovered America, a young Christopher Columbus reviving the heliocentric model of the universe and starting a revolution. So here's the path. You'll get a chance to see it again 54 years into the future. But anyway, so here's the path we're going to see on April 8, 2024, four days from now. The last eclipse in the Saros was on March 29, 2006, over North Africa. You go forward in time, um, the next one will be in the Saros family on April 20, 2042. So every 18 years, the eclipse path repeats itself somewhere on Earth. Why do I mention that? If we go back to the last eclipse, uh, August 21, 2017, um, same path, same, same eclipse path as uh, the eclipse of July 20, 1963. Some of you may have seen that partial eclipse. It's total in Canada, partial in the United States. In July of 1963, an 11-year-old boy saw that eclipse um, as a partial in New York, and he was so inspired by it that he decided to travel seven years later to the Carolinas to see his first total solar eclipse as an 18-year-old boy. 54 years later, he's getting ready to see the same eclipse again, three serial cycles later, in Mexico, and in between, he has traveled to every continent on Earth and seen 30 total solar eclipses. He's Fred Espinak, the world leader in eclipses, essentially. He's a retired NASA astrophysicist. So my pitch is, get your kids into the path today. Wouldn't it be fascinating if your nine or 10 or 11-year-old saw this April 8, 2024 solar eclipse and was inspired by it to become the next Mr. or Mrs. Eclipse in uh, May 11, 2078, when it comes back to our part of the country. You'll see the path here, crossing New Orleans, parts of Alabama, and uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and the Carolinas. So this eclipse that we're going to see on Monday will be back in 54 years. Mark your calendars. I probably won't make it. That's a Saros. All right, the other thing that makes this eclipse interesting is the, 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 the closer you are to true perigee, the longer the duration of the eclipse. So true perigee occurs, usually with, if you're within 90% of perigee, that's good enough to get a total solar eclipse. The April 8 eclipse, perigee occurs the night before on April 7. And you can see here, as we progress through the seral cycle, the closer we get to this cross point right here, the longer the duration of the eclipse. So here's the eclipse right here, not bad, but each successive eclipse in this serial cycle, we get longer duration. If you were able to make it to July 16, 2186, you would see a seven minute and 29 second duration eclipse because total or uh, true perigee occurs one hour before that particular eclipse. Obviously we won't make that one, but the one in 27, only three, four years from now, if you're willing to travel to Africa, will be very similar to this eclipse. All right. The last eclipse on August 21, 2017, that was part of a different Saros, Saros 145. We were fortunate enough to see it. We gave our, our members freedom to roam throughout the path, and we were scattered everywhere from Oregon to East Tennessee. And that worked in our favor because most, most of us uh, saw the eclipse. I don't know anyone who was clouded out. I came close. I was in Lebanon. We had two minutes and 32 seconds of duration during totality, just east of Memphis, of course. Made a last minute decision. This is the telescope I used, planning to use the same one again on Monday. And it's a very simple, I bought it used for a few hundred bucks. 
I got the solar filter that go, always goes on the top of the telescope. And then uh, just a simple car battery, and that just powers it. You do a polar alignment correctly, it will track the sun. And we had kids coming with their fam families with their kids coming, looking through the scope and seeing the partial phases of the eclipse. It was, real, it was a lot of fun. It looked like this around first contact, and I was worried. I learned something recently. If you're, if you're under cloudy skies, and again, clouds are different. I'm not an expert. But if it's a, supposed to be a mostly clear day and you see these high, puffy white clouds, those are convective clouds. The source of those clouds is heat from the sun being re-radiated back from the earth in the form of infrared radiation that as it reaches the upper layers of the atmosphere condenses to form clouds. When the eclipse occurs and uh, the moon is moving across the, the sun's disk, that energy source slowly gets shut off. So those clouds can dissipate as you get closer to totality. And that's what we experienced. We had clouds, but when we got to totality, about 15 to 20 minutes before, they started to move away. And we had a clear shot at the corona. In fact, we had a better view in Lebanon than a lot of people in Casper, Wyoming did. They had high cirrus clouds. So we, we were, were studying clouds a lot when we get you know, iffy forecasts. So the, uh, the, the eclipse is not just about the sun and the moon lining up. But anyway, here are some pictures that our members took. So this is Don. He was in, in Paducah, Kentucky. You can see here that um, during the partial phases of the eclipse, you're basically watching the moon slowly move across the disk of the sun, eat the sun, if you will. These little blemishes right here, these are sunspots. And you can see those if you have your, either your glasses or binoculars or through a telescope. And um, each one of these is actually larger than planet Earth. That's how big the sun is. So we have a shot at a pretty active solar disk for this particular eclipse. Not much happens for the first hour, but when you get to about 90%, you know, 15, 20 minutes before totality, things get really interesting. You get a crescent sun in the sky, similar to a crescent moon. These pictures were taken in Memphis. They had 94% partial. You get 97 for this one, almost 98. But uh, the same thing happens if you're in the path of totality. So if you're near trees and the light from the sun is being shown through the leaves and the trees, if you can project that onto a white surface, you may see little crescents. It's really fascinating. So we had this, uh, this, this picture was taken in Ely for the last eclipse. You can do this with your fingers also. You can just kind of cross them and make a mesh. If you can filter the light through, then uh, you can see these little crescents. So it's kind of cool. Or you can do a pinhole projection too. Uh, another, another nice tool that's very easy, most of us have, the, have this in our kitchen, is a colander for straining spaghetti or pasta. Bring that to you, bring that with you to the eclipse. And if you, you uh, line it up with the sun, you'll see little crescents. You can see this, it took this picture in, in Nevada also. And of course, people got really creative. You can take a, a broken mirror, put it on a, a cylinder and glue it together and turn it. And you can like, you know, project crescents, sun crescents onto a wall if you want to. So they got really, they got really creative. The shadows also change. This, this was fascinating to me. So again, the sun is still really bright, bright, you know, it's still day, but your the sunlight is now being uh, filtered through a crescent or a slit. So if, you, if you're standing parallel to that slit, or if you have an object where the edge of that object is parallel to the slit, the edges of the shadow will become really crisp and sharp. And then anything perpendicular to that slit will be, be kind of fuzzy and grainy. So observe changes in the light. It's really eerie. You know, a day like today, sadly, would have been a perfect day for the eclipse. But if you're clear, um, and you get to the, those deep partial phases, the, the, the light changes, the tone of the light changes, it becomes kind of muted and fatigued, and the shadows really change also. So it's, it's a really eerie effect. And I learned this recently also, your, your eye processes light different in low light conditions as opposed to full daylight. It's called the Purkinje effect. So in, day, in daytime, your cones dominate and they're skewed more toward the yellows and the reds. At nighttime, the cones take over, and, or the rods take over, and they're skewed more toward the, the greens and the blues. So the idea is wear bright colors on eclipse day, and as you get close to totality, see if those colors, your eye processes those colors differently, and they're kind of bland and muted and, and mushy and muddy 
So I have not directly experienced this yet, but it'll be something to look for for this next eclipse. So wear your reds and your greens or have somebody near you wearing red and green. Diamond ring, within a minute or so from the transition to totality, you're seeing the last bright rays of sunlight being filtered through the edge of the, of the sun's disk. And then Bailey's beads, again, the edge of the moon is not completely smooth. It's got craters and mountains on the edge. So seconds before totality, you're seeing those last wisps of uh, sunlight being filtered through the deepest valleys on the edge of the moon. And then you're plunged into totality. So this was our experience in Lebanon. The volume, I can't control it on the projector, but hopefully you can hear. One minute away from totality, here comes the shadow. Here comes the shadow of the moon. There's Venus right there to the right. Venus! There's Venus. No way. No way. Got it. No. Okay, here it comes. Here comes totality. We got it. Here it comes. Here it comes. All right, here we go. It's so dark. It's getting dark. It's so dark. Wow. Here it is. Oh my God. Oh my here it comes. No. Look at that. Oh my gosh, Venus. So dark. Wow. What? Did someone get a picture of Venus? This is unreal. Oh here comes the Corona. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Oh Keep flying. I can see the moon. Oh my God. See it. There it is. Okay. Oh Bailey's beads. Look at the sun. Look at the sun. Look at that sun. Look at that corona. Hey, to the left you see Regulus. There it is. You gotta see it. You see it to the left. Hey, there's a star in the left. Is that it way up there? Look at that corona. Oh my god. Look at that corona. That is unbelievable. Look at those streamers. If you don't believe in God, I'm sorry. Unbelievable. I see a prominence at 5 o'clock. Oh my God. Wow. That is amazing. Look at the twilight effect. There's Jupiter. Jupiter right over there to the left. Yeah, that little speck. Yep, that's Jupiter. That's the planet Jupiter. What's that one there? That's Venus and that's Jupiter. Venus? Venus to the left, Jupiter to the right. Look at that corona. Watch the corona. It's the only time you're gonna see the corona. Wow, look at how dark it is. Look at how dark it is. 360 degree sunset. 360 degree sunset. Unreal. Totality, you've got a 360 degree sunset all the way around the horizon. Looking at the corona. We only got about two and a half minutes. You can see Venus right there. What is this one? Is this Jupiter over That's here? Venus, Venus, Venus to the right. Here. Jupiter to the left. Jupiter over here. Yep, on locality. Unreal. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. Look at that. So Getting real close. Out of body right now. Real close. Temperature's dropping. Oh, so you can see that, that, see that corona. Really wow, look at that corona. Standing in the shadow of the moon. Look at those streamers. Wow, that is just amazing. Just amazing. Oh look, it's starting to get bright. Out to the right. Moon shadows departing. So now the now it's starting. Now daylight's emerging again. To the right side, you're gonna see the diamond ring again. Shining through the mountains of the moon. That sparkle is the mountains of the moon. Look at that. Yes. It's about five o'clock. It's the mountains of the moon. Now it's coming. Now it's coming. Now so it's now diamond ring. Ring. Now the diamond ring. ring. Now your glasses are going down. Oh, no. Hey, here it comes. Now it's getting bright again. Oh, no. Wow. Woo. Yeah. That is totality. We can still see Venus. Oh. Yep. You can still see, uh, yeah, you can still see Jupiter. You can still see Venus. Jupiter and Venus, right there. That is the most incredible thing ever. Seen. Look at that. Right. <laughs> okay. So, real time, two and a half minutes of duration during totality. Notice how I spent my time during totality. And again, I had this plan down to the second. It's pretty rare to be in the moon's shadow. So. 
First of all, you can see the effects, the 360 degree sunset all the way around the horizon. It doesn't get as dark as night, kind of about as dark as it does, probably right about now, 30 minutes or so after sunset. See the bright stars coming out, Venus, Jupiter, and then of course the corona is the majesty of the eclipse. So I spent most of my time just staring at the sun during totality with my naked eye, no glasses, nothing. And the, the, you know, the corona is not a static thing. You're seeing charged particles moving along the uh, magnetic field lines of the sun's hot, tenuous outer atmosphere. I can show you picture after picture of the corona, even by some of the best astrophotographers in the world. It doesn't come close to what your eye sees during totality. So that's my one shot. If I'm in the path, I'm going to spend 60 to 70% of my time just, just staring at the corona and basically audibly talking about what do I see. The other thing is you saw me pick up binoculars. Those are not solar filtered binoculars. Again, during totality, those are just regular handheld binoculars. So I'm looking at the sun with regular binoculars and I can see up close the details in the corona as well as the, the prominences and the flares and some of the other things. Um, so this is a picture that one of our members took in Kentucky, again, of the corona. And this is another one that one of our members took in Perryville, Missouri, Freddie. Uh, this one was taken by Ross, and this is a composite. This is a, uh, an HDR image where you're basically taking several different exposures and then stacking them in software. And of course, you can see a lot of the details of the corona coming out. It's never the same. They're like snowflakes. You know, the corona is never the same for any eclipse. So that's, that's the cool thing about seeing multiple eclipses. I like this one. Bob took this one in uh, Kentucky. Here you can see the pink and reddish uh, flares and prominences on the edge of the sun. That's really cool to see during totality. And again, that's where the handheld binoculars come in. Only during totality. Don't do it during the partial phases. You'll damage your eyes. And then of course, I love this picture. Sarah took this one in Dover. You can see the uh, silhouette of the uh, eclipse sky and some of the trees around there. And then up top, you see the black hole in the sky. And then you see the pink and yellow and all the different colors of the corona all around it. So love this picture. And then I threw a Waffle House in there because we live in the South. And, you know, you got to have a Waffle House picture, right? Uh, this one was taken by Rick Feinberg, Sky and Telescope Magazine. Again, this is one of the most advanced pictures in the world of the corona during totality. That's Regulus. This one was in Leo. I could see Regulus with my binoculars during totality. And again, I make the same point. This is a great picture. Love it. It's one of the most sophisticated pictures during totality. It doesn't compare to what your eye will see during totality. This is the best camera right here. That's why, you know, if, you could, if you're fortunate enough to get into the path and it's clear and you, and you can time it down to the second, how long you've got, and I'll show you how to do that. Spend your time as much as you can just staring at that eclipse sun. It's your only shot to see it. So, and then you can have some fun with these. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of pictures. I don't even know what's real and what isn't anymore, right? Is that Photoshop? No, that's yeah, a, a cool picture. All right, a little history. July 29, 1878. This is a sketch of the corona from the top of Pikes Peak by Samuel Piermont Langley. He was the first to document that the outer corona could extend for millions of kilometers into space. Can you imagine the view of a total solar eclipse from the top of Pikes Peak? There's a book on the 1878 eclipse in the back. I've read it once, I need to read it again. I would highly recommend it. Probably the most famous eclipse in, in American history. From the base of, of uh, Pikes Peak, same eclipse, this picture is probably the most iconic of that particular eclipse. And they're looking at the eclipse sun with the mountains silhouetted in the background. Again, two years after Colorado became a state. Quote, the scene was now one of surprising beauty for Pikes Peak far away to the south still remained in sunlight, looming in rosy outline while the horizon that a moment before was ochre now glowed with red, gold, pink, and lilac. Stars and planets came out while the corona gleamed with a pale nebulous light and the heavens above acquired a shade of blue that mortal cannot describe. George Stanley, Snake River Pass, Colorado. All right, so let's kind of review the fundamentals here. If you're gonna stay in Memphis, there will never come a time when you can look at the sun naked eye during an eclipse. Always use your glasses. We got tons of pair here. Take as many as you need. Got them in the back. I still got plenty. We're trying to get rid of them because we only got four days left. So definitely get your solar glasses. 
If you get into the path of totality, from first contact until the totality begins, always use your solar filters and your glasses. When you get to totality, those two to four minutes, what I just showed you, it is safe to take off your eclipse glasses and look at the sun naked eye. In fact, we recommend it. It's your only shot to see the corona. Keep saying it over and over again. This is the beauty and the majesty of a solar eclipse is seeing that corona as well as the other effects. Again, looking at the corona, 360 degree sunset, you know, maybe observe, observing the bright stars and planets. You know, think of how you're going to devy up your time, if you will, during totality. Just don't fool with your equipment. You know, you, so if you're going to photograph the eclipse or do anything, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm divorcing myself from my equipment and I'm looking at the sun uh, during totality. And then, of course, when the uh, totality ends on the back end, you got to put those glasses on again. So always take care of your eyes when you're watching an eclipse. You know, American Paper Optics makes these eclipses, these eclipse glasses. Got them in the back there. Library's providing them also. Got to do a little bragging. This is John Jarrett. He's the CEO of American Paper Optics. The company's in Bartlett. They're the number one distributor of the eclipse glasses in the world. Right here in Memphis, 75 million of them that they're going to ship out. And a couple of members of Biden's cabinet, including uh, Isabel Casillas Guzman, small business administrator. They were in town last week. And I was fortunate enough to be invited to an exclusive tour of that event. So way to go, John. We'll see you in a couple years for the next one. Um, they also make a solar snap app. And if you want to take pictures, I get this question sometimes with your iPhone. Um, they have an app for that. So it comes in a little package and you can put a filter on the front of your phone, either with Velcro or tape. And then you get a free app that you you download and you can focus the sun's disc in your iPhone and tweak the zoom, the exposure and the uh, focus. And basically, you know, take a picture of the sun's disc by hand with your phone. It's not DSLR quality, but it's still good enough if you want to just do quick social media stuff and, and document the experience. So this is a, a video of me kind of showing you how to do that. It's very simple. You just tweak it, you know, you get a little bit of practice to get the hang of it. But this is great for the partial phases of the eclipse. And you can see this is what I did for the annular back in October. Partial, deep partial, and then the ring of fire for annularity for that eclipse. I do have a tutorial on this on my personal YouTube channel, but it's pretty, hopefully pretty intuitive to, to figure out. And then somebody else got these pictures for the uh, hybrid eclipse in somewhere in the Pacific last April. A year ago, they had a hybrid eclipse, so there's a couple of minutes of totality. A couple of, you know, a couple of seconds of totality, actually. All right, another tool that I like, it's getting a little late now to get these, but uh, Lunt makes sun oculars. These are special solar filtered binoculars. And these, again, are great for looking at the sun during the partial phases because they magnify the sun. And you can not only see, you know, the different partial phases of the eclipse, but you can see details on the surface of the sun, like sunspots and stuff. So I love these. These are great, not only for eclipses, but just for regular solar viewing. Um, pinhole projection. This isn't really my thing. Mylan's got a couple of examples. What you can do is take a cardboard box, cut a hole out of it, put foil over it, poke a hole in it and, and do projection. And these are some examples. Uh, you want to talk about the longer one versus the shorter one? Yeah. Uh, so the simpler one is just a cereal box on one end, cut a hole on either side, cover one of those holes with aluminum foil, poke a small hole in it. You look in the other hole with your back to the sun. So the light from the sun goes through the pinhole, projects an image of the sun on the other end of the box. The longer the box, the larger the image. You remember the picture of the pinhole projections through the leaves of the trees? So that's a longer distance than the length of this box. That's even better. But if you don't have a tree nearby, you can get a box. Here I cut a small hole in one end, covered it with aluminum foil, poked a little hole in it. I put some white paper on the inside on the opposite end. Don't have to cut an eye hole because I can just put the box over my head and look at the image of the sun on the paper. So this will be a little bit bigger image than the cereal box. Yep. Safe way to view the eclipse. 
Yep. This is uh, indirect partial phases. So you're not looking directly at any light coming from the sun. Yep. And pretty simple too. And in fact, you got a sun funnel. Why don't you just show them that a minute too? Yeah. Myelin gets really sophisticated with this. This is if you have a telescope. This is a variation on what you see on the screen there. Uh, the trouble with that arrangement is there's light coming through open air to get to the screen. And if it's high enough, little kid might run up and try to look into the telescope and they'd go blind. So you don't want that to happen. Uh, I made a sun funnel. So there's an eyepiece here. It uses the same thing, a uh, telescope. But at the end, there's a mirror that reflects the light through the eyepiece, and then an image is projected on this rear projection screen material. Uh, and that's safe, and more than one person can look at a time. Uh, it's kind of funny, the Collierville Library, we had people like putting their face right yeah, up yeah. to it. Yeah, you don't have to go that far. Eyepieces. <laughs> yeah. But you don't have to. You could have five people standing around looking at the image simultaneously with this. Yep. And, and it's a closed system. No direct light from the sun is hitting anyone. Yep. Another thing you can think about doing is sketching the corona. This would be a great exercise for kids if you could talk them into it. Of course, you don't want to spend your whole time in totality doing this, but uh, Debbie is another eclipse chaser. She spoke at our group last year. She's seen 15 all around the world in the last 40 years. Her first one was in Indonesia in 1983, and she uh, sketched the corona. So you take a you know, obviously you have uh, the black disk of the sun and then you sketch the shape of the, the, the solar streamers and then you know where the prominences are. And in this particular case, she had Betelgeuse and Mars also in the field of view. It makes it more memorable because however long your duration is, whether it's, again, two and a half minutes is what I had in, for the last one. This one, if you can get to the center line, conceivably you could get over four minutes. That time goes fast. It'll feel like eight seconds. So it'll be over and you'll, you'll forget what you saw. If you sketch it, potentially it could be more memorable. And if you ever see another solar eclipse, you'll remember the experience of seeing this one even more. So I'll just mention that. Uh, more eclipse fundamentals. There are four contact points. This is what we talk about. Contact one, two, three, and four. C1, contact one is when the moon first touches the sun. And you get that little notch out of the, uh, the sun's disk. In this area, it'll occur around 12.37 p.m. on Monday. And then the partial phases last for about an hour and 20 minutes. Contact two is when the moon reaches the other side and totality begins. So you get diamond ring, Bailey's beads, and then it goes dark. That'll occur, won't occur here, but if you're a little further west, Jonesboro around 1.55 p.m. Memphis will get a deep partial. It'll max out about 1.57 p.m. here. Very thin crescent, I'll show you in a minute. Totality lasts for a couple minutes and then third contact is when the moon moves off of the sun. And you saw from my video, it started getting light again and you see diamond ring, Bailey's beads on the, on the back end and then the, the eclipse is based, totality's over. But then you got the back end partial phases that last for about hour and 20 minutes. And then fourth contact is when the moon finally moves off the disc and then it's over around 3.15 in the afternoon. All right, here's a simulation of what you're gonna see in Memphis versus what you would see in Jonesboro if you were in the path of totality. Again, first contact begins about 1237, and you can see here the moon slowly moving over the sun, eating the sun, as you will, as we progress. So we're, you know, we're getting close to one o'clock p.m. Central Time in both areas, and uh, not much is happening. Again, first hour or so, you're just chilling and watching the sun slowly get eclipsed. So around 140 is when things start to get really interesting. So 110, 112, and say again, we're just kind of going through the partial phases here. But um, you're just kind of watching this either with your binoculars or with your glasses, or if you got a telescope or some type of indirect projection. But then when you start getting into the deep partial, the light starts to change, temperature starts to drop a little bit, and the light gets really eerie. So. Right around this time, 1.30, 140 is when things start to become pretty interesting. So now we're getting, you know, again, 138, 139, 140 p.m. So we're getting close now to max eclipse. So now max eclipse in Memphis is 1.57 p.m. Watch what happens in Memphis versus what happens in Jonesboro. So Jonesboro, Arkansas, again, you're in the path. All of a sudden, boom, here comes totality. Corona comes out. 
And then, of course, you get to the back end partial. So um, 155, 158, that's totality. If you were in Jonesboro, and then the eclipse again ends around one, uh, 315, you don't get C2 or C3 in Memphis because we get a deep partial. So that's technically what happens and why we preach, if you can, get into the path. So on a scale of 1 to 10, there's three types of eclipses, a partial, an annular, and a total. So what are they like experientially on a scale of 1 to 10? Partial would be a 3, annular is a 7, uh, total would be a 10 million. That's why we say, you know, obviously get into the path if you can. Now what's out in the uh, totality? This is another simulation. It's a program called Stellarium for looking at things in the sky, whether it's daylight or, or nighttime. We use this program a lot. It's free. You can get it on the web. And basically, I'm showing you what, what it would look like in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Again, right around 1230. So I'm going forward. First contact is 1238. And I'm starting to see it form, again, around 5 o'clock on the disk of the sun. Very uh, little, sl uh, small notch, if you will, as the moon is starting to make contact with the sun in our sky. Now we go forward in time, 1240. I'm kind of zooming out here a little bit. So again, I'm showing you kind of the progression of the eclipse from the vantage point of hopefully a clear spot in, in Jonesboro. This is a simulation. What would you see in the sky? So now it's 1241. Again, totality begins around 155. So I'm speeding up time here. I'm about 130 right now, kind of reacquainting myself or, or realigning myself. So now we get, ooh, now it gets interesting. Around 150 in the afternoon, what does it look like? So I zoom in. And again, I'm about 98, 99% eclipse. Very similar to what we would see here in Memphis at the deep partial. So now we go forward, and I got just a sliver of a sun showing, mostly eclipsed by the moon. And I'm kind of showing what the sky looks like as, the, as it changes. Now, the simulation doesn't really do justice to what you see because it's still daylight until seconds before totality. So it becomes dark almost instantly. You can see the transformation from the Bailey's bead to the diamond ring was pretty, or from Bailey's beads to totality was pretty, uh, pretty abrupt, if you will. So now it's, you know, 153. I'm going forward. I just got a little sliver. So this is around Bailey's beads. And now, of course, we get into totality. So now the, the, the moon has eclipsed the sun. Corona comes out. What's in the sky during totality? I can go down, if I look on the lower right of the sun, Venus is out, and then you may have a shot at Saturn. And just for kicks, I'm zooming in to see what Saturn would look like if you could see it through a telescope. You can see the rings edge on here, and then some of the moons of Saturn. So this is what Saturn would look like if you could zoom in with a powerful telescope during totality. Venus will also be out. It'll be bright. It'll be the brightest thing in the sky. And the reason is because Venus is nearly full. You've seen a gibbous moon. This is basically a gibbous Venus, if we were to zoom in during totality. And then the other bright planet that's out is Jupiter. And that's, again, higher up in the sky to the upper left. And uh, what would Jupiter look like if we could zoom in? You could see the four Galilean moons. And uh, you would actually have a shot at the great red spot. You won't see it, but isn't it interesting that the great red spot is out during totality on April 8th? And you may have a shot at some other things, too. There's some other bright stars that might be out. Although, you know, cloud cover and a deep, you know, a twilight around the horizon might obstruct that view. But look for Venus, look for Jupiter, and possibly Saturn during totality. So that's what's out. Okay, why totality as opposed to a partial eclipse? I get this question. You know, we're in Memphis, 97%. That's pretty good. You know, if I can get 98% in Memphis, why do we need to get into the path of totality? So the sun during totality, you're seeing the corona. That's about as bright as a full moon. The sun on a sunny day like today is a million times brighter than a full moon or what you would see during totality. So even at 99%, you're looking at a sun that's 10,000 times brighter than it would be during the eclipse. Even at 99.9%, the sun is a thousand times brighter than it would be during totality. So it's literally the difference between day and night. You miss out on everything if you're not in totality. You know, no behavior changes in animals, shadow bands, plunge into darkness, Bailey's beads, diamond ring, etc. So again, 
We try to encourage people to make that effort to get into the path of totality. Having said all that, I show this slide for years, or no, really a couple of years I've been giving this presentation. This is climatology data going back 20 years in the path. And the idea is the further north you go, the higher the probability of cloud cover, the further south you go, the smaller the probability. This slide is completely worthless now because we have a forecast. And basically it's the opposite. We thought Texas was the spot. It turns out the best spot is probably Maine right now. Who knew? So this is what it looked like in the path last year, April 8, 2023. Maybe we'll look out and get something similar in the north. And uh, this is a snapshot using pivotal weather that I took yesterday when I gave this presentation. And it's the opposite of what you think. So in this particular simulation of weather using several models that are kind of blended together without getting into too many details, white is actually good. White means it's clear, blue is cloudy. So you wanna be, you wanna avoid the blue areas as much as possible. So this is a snapshot that I took about an, a couple hours ago before I put this presentation together. And you can see here, as of right now, this is the area that we're watching. So maybe north, you know, southern Missouri and uh, parts of Illinois, and it changes a lot. Every six hours or so, we're getting updates on this and obsessing over it because we're trying to fine tune the forecast and make a last minute decision. So people have been asking me for months, where am I going to see this eclipse? I still don't know. I may not know until Sunday where I'm going. Very stressful time. But what's interesting is Maine has been the sure bet. And again, I never would have guessed on Maine or I would have booked something there a year ago. So they're getting a nor'easter there now. Who knew that Maine was the spot to go, right? So there's your path. And again, four strategic points from Memphis, Cape Girardeau and Hardy, Arkansas, kind of plan A. We can probably eliminate these two now, going straight west to Little Rock or going south into Texas. Not gonna work out based on this forecast. So this was kind of plan A all along anyway, and it's kind of nice to know that that may still be in play. But if you're gonna take a shot at it, you gotta get your act together now and plan to leave early, maybe Saturday or very early on Sunday, and just constantly be watching that weather. I'm learning as I go too, and I may not get this one right. This is a tough forecast. In terms of duration, um, if you're fortunate enough to get to Cape Girardeau, four minutes and seven seconds near the center line. Jonesboro gets two minutes and 36 seconds. If you get up to Hardy, four minutes and 12 seconds. Very generous duration for this eclipse, over four minutes. You gotta go further north, well, this is Little Rock, probably not gonna work out, but Conway, three minutes and 53 seconds. You gotta go north into Indiana, four minutes and five seconds in Vincennes, Indiana. And then of course, Cleveland, you know, I put some other points in the path here, uh, just for comparison, so. If you're looking for a solar eclipse app, the best one that I know of is Totality by Big Kid Science. It's the simplest app and uh, it's free. All you do is download it. And what you can do with this app, all you do is click the start button. It brings up an interactive map of the eclipse path and you can zoom in down to the detail of where you wanna be in the path. And it will tell you the duration of the eclipse and the exact times of those four contact points down to the second. And that's good information to have, especially if you've got to move on eclipse day, because then you know exactly when the eclipse starts, if you want to ca uh, capture first contact and, you know, when totality begins. And then, you know, it's just good to have those timings down to the second. So, you know, when to take your glasses on, put them, or put your glasses on, take them off, et cetera. So this is a good app. If you want, uh, okay, another one is, uh, is um, the Solar Eclipse Timer app by Gordon Telepun. And this one also is pretty clever. So it looks sophisticated, but if you're in the path, you click on this button here, select an eclipse to time, and then you load your GPS coordinates and the, the app will actually speak to you during the eclipse. They will tell you, you know, first contact in one minute. You know, do this or 
second contact in, in one minute, observe for shadow bands, you know, take your filters off. Um, third contact in 30 seconds, you know, put your eclipse glasses back on. So this is a pretty clever little app. I'll mention this, uh, we are a partner with Sky and Telescope. They have a special solar eclipse edition available for about 10 bucks at Barnes and Noble. And of course we've been promoting this. And uh, if you wanna know when the next one is, uh, August 23, 2044 specifically. And you can see here, it just barely clips the lower 48 in Eastern Montana and North Dakota. If you don't wanna wait that long, same Cerro cycle, 18 years earlier, it comes to Spain. So August, 20, or August 12, 2026 might be a nice trip to Spain if you, uh, if you want to catch the next one. That's it. Thank you very much. We got Eclipse glasses, and uh, I'll stick around if you guys got any questions. <laughs>